I would like to hold any questions until the end because I'd yep. like to give Fiona a chance to get going. Great. Um, well, thanks very much, Mike, for inviting me to talk, and thanks everyone for sticking around. I know it's quite late, so I'll try not to take too much more of your time. Um, today, I'll be giving my talk, uh, Is the Grizzled Skipper Pickier in the North? An Exploration of a Specialist Butterfly's Habitat Requirements Across its UK Range. So I'm currently doing a PhD on the Grizzled Skipper at the University of Liverpool with Dr Jenny Hodgson, and um, I'm partnered with Butterfly Conservation, um, aiming to submit my thesis in less than a month, so that's exciting. So um, there are quite a few species which have limited um, range in the UK, they're restricted to the south of the UK, but you can find them in more widespread habitats in Europe. And in a lot of cases, that's because they have climate limitations, they're restricted to warm areas. But one of the things that a changing climate might do with warm summers is allow some of these species to expand northwards and in the UK, because a lot of species meet their northern limit within, within the UK, they might be able to move their northern limits further up, be able to expand into new areas. And so here we have an example from a study um, 10 years ago, which looked at the, um, the northern limit of some invertebrates in the UK and how it shifted over 25 years. And so what you can see is that this is for spiders, beetles, butterflies, grasshoppers that over 25 years, because this um, vertical line is a movement of zero kilometers, the majority of species appear to shift their northern limits further, further north. See it shifted um, upwards latitudinally. But what you can also see from this is that the rates of shift are pretty variable between species. And you can see that actually, some of them appear to have even contracted their range further south. And there are plenty of reasons why species might shift at different rates. It could be different dispersal capacity. It could be uh, different exposure or sensitivity to climate. But one of the biggest factors is um, boundaries to movement. That is habitat fragmentation. If the habitat's fragmented and they can't jump between patches, they won't be able to track their shifting climate niche as the summers get warmer. Um, <clears throat> and so for a lot of species, when they get to their Northern cold limit, um, they're often restricted to the warmest microclimates, and that tends to be um, open habitats, lots of bare ground, short sward, not too shaded, and often southern facing slopes. So, for example, looking at the expansion of the silver spotted skipper, when they initially looked in 1982 at the slopes that occupied towards the north of its range, it tended to only occupy the south facing slopes. Um, but when they went back and looked at where it got occupied later on after it had more time to expand, it had started to move on to all different facing slopes, suggesting it was no longer strict to just the warmest microclimates. And that's a trend we see in a few different species. And that is particularly relevant to the species that I'm talking about today, which is the grizzled skipper. <laughs> so the grizzled skipper is an early successional specialist. What that means it can occupy a few different habitat types, but they need to be in their earlier stages of succession. So like open grassland with patches of bare ground, uh, not, not too many woody vegetation or tall swords, um, having to occupy coppiced woodlands or glades or rides, or even abandoned industrial sites and quarries. Um, and so it tends to stay in the south of the UK. You can see its distribution there, going up to maybe kind of Derbyshire or Warwickshire area. It used to be found in, in Yorkshire, but has since gone extinct there. But it's of particular concern because since 1976, it's undergone declines in occurrence of over 50% and uh, declines in abundance of 37%, and is now a priority species. Um, but there was a ray of hope for the grizzled skipper in that we thought because it's warm preferring, it might be able to take advantage of the conditions getting warmer. So there was a study um, again, 10 years ago by Satelli et al, which looked at the potential climate suitability area for the grizzled skipper presently and in the future. So what this figure shows is the bright orange area is the overlap between where is currently climatically suitable and where it could be suitable in the future. So there are two different scenarios here on the top being the most sustainable, lowest climate change scenario, on the bottom being a very much more capitalist, much more aggressive climate change scenario. Um, so bright orange is where they currently are and could be in the future. Um, dark orange is where they currently are not, but could expand to. 
and the grey is where they currently are, but could be lost because it becomes too warm. Um, and what you can see is that even by 2050, in the mildest climate scenario, they expected the grizzled skipper would be able to expand its range north. Um, and within the UK, we should see some northern expansion. And so because we were interested in this, we did a study looking at population trends of the grizzled skipper, looking at to see in the north, do its population trends look more positive? Is that a sign it could be about to expand? But what we actually found is that the trends in the north appear to be more negative than in the south. Um, so you can see here, there are two figures uh, on the um, x-axis, it's the year, and on the y-axis, it looks at the, um, the index from the UK BMS population size over time. And what you can see is that based on our model, um, in the northwest, the trends appear to be steeper than in the south. So it looks like trends are actually more negative in the north which would run contrary to the suggestion that they might be about to expand. And we were also interested in the effect of climate in driving these trends. And so we modeled the trend over time, the population size, and that's the black line with the observed climate. But we also tried fixing the climate. So it didn't change over the time period, stayed at the original values. And what you can see in the red line, and what you can see is that there really wasn't any real change in that trajectory. It seems like therefore, the climate changes we've seen aren't what's driving the overall declines of the grizzled skipper. And instead, it's much more likely to be, as Jamie touched on in his talk, um, habitat degradation, loss of early successional habitat, because we've moved on from traditional land management practices like coppicing, uh, like grazing at low intensities and field rotations, and moved on to much more intensive agriculture. Um, and so, because we notice there are steeper declines in the north, it raises some questions. That is, for example, are the habitat requirements strict from the north? And could that may be one of the reasons why they're declining more there? Maybe they need more intervention or is there something else at play? And so for that purpose, we decided to ask the following questions. And that is, what are the habitat features related to abundance and occupancy? So what are some predictors of suitable habitat? Um, do these predictors change with geography? So are there different predictors in the north and the south or in the east and the west? And finally, do habitat features change with habitat type? So do grizzled skippers require different habitat in woodland or grassland dominated areas? There could be some biotic or abiotic factors that lead them to require different conditions. And so in order to do that, back in uh, 2018, a long time ago, pre-COVID, uh, went out to 33 different sites around the UK with UK BMS Transex, uh, where we knew there were grizzled skipper populations. And we tried to get a site, a sample of sites that was representative of north and northing, um, easting, and also woodland cover. So what you can see is the locations of our sites. Each rectangle is uh, one of the sites we went to, one of the Transex, and each one of the bars within the, uh, within the rectangles are one of the sections within the transect. So we tried to get a mixture of, of different um, habitat types there, a mixture of different woodland covers. And while we were there, we went along all of the transect routes and we put out one meter by one meter quadrats um, along randomly along the sections um, to record some features of habitat that we would then use to look at what predicted butterfly abundance or presence. And so what we measured were things that had been established to be relevant for the grizzled skipper before. That was um, the ratio of bare ground to dead vegetation and total non-life cover, um, rabbit dropping presence to indicate grazing pressure, uh, mean sward height, the total host plant cover, that is the cover of host plants the grizzled skipper is known to feed on um, when it's in its larval stages, the ratio of different host plant types that might be found in different habitat types, um, overhead shade, so either none, partial or full, or the nectar species count, so kind of a diversity of nectar. And then we put that into a model. So we used all these habitat features and we made two sets of models, one that looked at the count, and another that looked at the likelihood of presence. Um, and because we also were aware of effects of seasonality on the habitat, we tried to incorporate the survey date and um, because of spillover effects between sections, try to account for um, potentially very high population sections having an effect on nearby ones by having a spatial auto covariate. And so we did that for just the habitat features alone, but because we're also interested in geography, 
We also looked at the habitat features and they, how they interact with latitude and with longitude and with woodland cover. So we essentially had three sets of models for both abundance and for occupancy. And so we looked at out of all of those models, which habitat features appear to be the most significant or help the models to fit the best. So going back to the first question, what were the habitat features that predicted abundance and occupancy? Um, what we found was that shade appeared in most of the models as a negative effect that was shadier areas tended to be associated with fewer butterflies and it was less likely for butterflies to be there. Um, and sward height was negatively linked to butterflies being there, which um, but it seems to suggest that you know, open overhead canopies, so not closed off areas um, and short swards, you can see there's a negative relationship between sword, sward height and likelihood of presence and shade level and likelihood of presence. But we also found that nectar diversity was positively linked to abundance. So it seems like food availability um, was relevant for the visit skipper. So again, you can see positive effect of nectar species, negative effect of shade level. Um, so we'd identified the, some of the main features, but we were interested in whether those changed geographically. And what we found was that there are a few isolated effects. So you can, won't go into too much detail here, but you can see that nectar species appear to have a more positive effect in the north. Um, you can see that in the east, total non-live cover had a negative effect in the west, but a positive effect in the east. And you can see that shade also had a negative effect in the west and a positive effect on the east. Um, so these aren't particularly relevant, so I go, won't go into them. But what they do seem to show is that microclimate requirements, at least, don't seem to vary with geography. So it doesn't seem like the northern sites require warmer microclimates than the southern sites. And so finally, we're interested in whether habitat predictors suitability um, varied with grassland or woodland. Um, and the main effect that we found that was interesting was um, the interaction of non-live cover. So we expected that non-live cover would have a positive effect as it tends to be associated with warmer patches um, and the female grizzle skippers use them as like search images when they're breeding. And um, it didn't appear to be significant on its own, but when you added in wood, it became significant. So you can see that when there's little wood cover, total non-live cover does have a positive effect. But when it gets to high wood cover, um, total non-life cover appears to have almost no effect or even a negative one. And that same pattern is shown in this other graph here, where at average woodland cover, non-life cover is positive. And that's probably because when it's open grassland, uh, non-life cover is associated with warm microclimates, but um, in heavier woodlands, a lack of live cover might suggest not much like getting through closed canopy, um, not much vegetation in the understory which would make for not very great visit skipper habitat. And so what we can take away from this is most of the effects that were kept in the models that were important for grizzled skipper were related to warmer microclimates. So it seems like shade, sward height, non-live cover, they were some of the most important effects. And what we also saw was that the habitat requirements don't appear to be strict in the north. And why this is particularly relevant is as we've seen steeper declines in the north, that suggests that something else is responsible. And so that suggests that there is potentially differences in the north and south or geographically about the habitat availability or quality or connectivity. And there could be plenty of reasons for this. It could be the way that the habitat is managed. It could be the type of habitat and the pressures it faces. It could be barriers to movement, maybe denser woodlands in between patches. So all of that will require probably some more investigation on a, on a smaller scale. But the other reason why that's important is it highlights that potentially for other species that require similar habitats may also experience similar, similar difficulties if they need to track their climate envelope as it shifts further north. So that's something to watch out for. And finally, the fact that microclimate appeared to be a fairly important um, factor for the grizzled skipper is particularly relevant in the situation we find ourselves in today, where it seems like succession is an increasing threat to a lot of butterflies and other invertebrates that rely on those open habitats, partly because we've abandoned traditional management, so a lot of habitats reverting back to scrub or woodland, and partly because now there's more nutrient deposition from fertilizer and from the atmosphere, as well as potentially 
growing, um, lengthening growing seasons and less vegetation dieback in the winter. People might have noticed um, there's been more grass growth or there's been fewer diet that there's been fewer events of dieback or it seems like everything's growing up and becoming shadier and there's more at scrub encroachment. And so the one positive to this is to suggest that we do have the ability to control what happens for the grizzled skipper and we have a direction to go in to make sure that we can try and keep it keep it going and allow it to follow its climate niche. So Thank you everyone for listening and um, I'd like to thank my supervisors and all of the amazing volunteers that helped me to do this work. Um, and thanks Mike for inviting me and does anybody have any questions? Well, thank you very much Fiona.